A warm welcome to the Théâtre Bleu uh, for a practical tools and techniques uh, session on the long-term wealth performance for the next decade and beyond. Uh, my name is Ralph Stefan von Bartleben from Mainz, Germany, and it's my great pleasure to host this session together with my friend Didier Cheche, who needs no introduction from Toulouse, France. Uh, we have an excellent faculty of discussions. On my left side, Ole de Bakker from Denmark. We have Denny Dreer from Israel. Uh, we're joined by Howard Herman from the United States. Uh, we have Magdalena Ellebach from Germany as a cardiac surgeon and Vasilis Banulas from United Kingdom. Uh, this will be a very practical session with a lot of discussion, less slides, and we'll deep dive into the practical experience of minimalistic tower approach with a life case from Leipzig. This will be led by Mohamed Abdel Wahab from the Leipzig Heart Center, together with Philip Kiefer, and we will also see a case of the brand new FX platform uh, from the Evolute platform. So our session objectives are to discuss how to improve tower outcomes for an ever younger population with longer life expectancies. You should understand the structural challenges of providing tower services, and we want to learn how to use innovation to achieve optimal outcomes and procedure efficacies. These are the potential interests of uh, conflicts of interest for all participants, so we will not display them in each individual slide or talk. And I now hand over to my co-chair, which is mm -hmm. Didier, to continue. Didier, please. Yeah, so um, as you are more aware now about the, um, the way these sessions are built, once again, it's, uh, it's all about interaction. So feel free to, uh, to come up with any kind of comments that you may have, any kind of questions or points that you would like to raise. You have uh, three ways that you can achieve that. The first one, you raise your hand, and then we're going to uh, go directly to you, bring a microphone. Or you have dedicated microphone within the room, so feel free to go to these microphones to come with your questions. And at last, what you can utilize as well is the app. So you should have all downloaded the app. If not, use the next two minutes to do so. And then you can uh, uh, directly send us your questions. And you, they, we will prioritize your question just to make you sure that we meet your expectations and we uh, answer all, uh, anything you have in mind. So having said that, I, I guess it's time to, uh, to start. Uh, uh, Stefan, with the first, uh, the first point that you, we wanted to, uh, to discuss. Yeah, and thank you. We want to understand, of course, the evolving patient need, Didier, uh, that we see for Tavar. Uh, Tavar now, since 2015 to 17, has crossed in all major countries, actually, the volume of Tavar. And it's important to see how the patient population and the patient selection change over time. And who would be better to discuss this topic than a heart surgeon? So we're happy to have Magdalena here, and uh, we can pull up her first slides just to explain this graphically. So these will not be presentations, they will just be background slides where we do the discussion around it. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to, to shortly yes. sum up what I believe that are considerations and thoughts that we should have when we treat our patients in the near future. And as mentioned, um, we've, we've come from treating inoperable, high-risk TAVR patients to treating younger, low-risk patients. And in doing so, we have to take other things uh, into, into consideration than we previously had to. For one, these patients have concomitant disease. It may be ortopathy, <laughs> coronary disease, or valvular disease. And these patients will live to survive to see a progression of this disease. And we need to have a plan for, for the treatment in the future of these possible uh, complications. Applications. Coronary disease, first thing that comes to mind is that we have to make sure that we have a coronary access available to be able to treat, for example, interventionally the coronary disease. <clears throat> Furthermore, durability is relevant for younger patients. And going hand in hand with durability is the optimal result from TAVR, meaning we need to make sure we have no PVL, we have no conduction disturbances, we don't have vascular or, or, or bleeding complications that can, can infringe on, on outcomes. And of course, last but not least, we have to be able to think of future treatments. Say, it, may it be TAV and TAV, or may it be SAV or after TAV, but these things need to be taken into account and, and um, considered when we treat the patient with the first, first valve. 
So if we look into the Scandinavian experience, Ola, what do you know from the Danish and also the Sweetheart, uh, actually, registries? How has the European perspective of treatment also in Northern Europe changed? What's your perspective on this? Well, even within the Nordics, there is a couple of changes because I, I looked actually rather recently on the, on the Swedish uh, data and there you can see that the average age of their patients they're treating with Tavi is still close to 80 years. I mean, it was 78, 79. Whereas in Denmark, if I know this, the data from Denmark as I'm working there, still the, the age is falling down there a little bit. So, um, but uh, indeed, then we can come maybe to this next topic. Um, first, what is, if we look at on a world perspective, global perspective, um, where has Tavi come now in 2023? And this is a slide showing the, the volumes. You see it's almost an exponential growth, I would say, uh, compared to 10 years ago. So now, uh, nowadays, there's uh, done more than 200,000 uh, Tavis worldwide. Uh, so you see the rest of the world, USA, uh, Europe. I think the last uh, data that I knew from TVT from two years ago or one year ago was more than 70,000 Tavis a year uh, in the US alone. So you see it uh, has been an exponential uh, growth there. And then, sorry about that. Um, and then what can we expect in the next decade? Yeah. I would say, well, there is still growth to be expected in the, in the next decade and in, the, in these next uh, two, three minutes. I think I want to explain what is it, the driver behind this. First of all, aging of the world population. If we look to the Western population, I think there, there we will still see growth because we see more and more elderly and really elderly, like uh, not only octogenarians, but patients above 90 years. We see this increasingly. Um, and then on the world scale, you see, for example, it's shocking if you look to this uh, distribution of the population in a way and the age scale in China and India, if you see to in 2000 and 2050, so these countries, they will get a much elderly or a big number of patients above 60 years in, in the next uh, decades. And then, so that's one driver, the aging of the population. Uh, another thing is that Tavi is coming down in, in, in age, so treating younger and younger patients. First, maybe look at the right of the slide. You, this is published data from, uh, from last year. Um, you see in the age category above 80 years in the US, it's almost 100% are, are treated with Tavi. In the age group between 65 and 80, there's already almost close to 90% of these patients with uh, isolated uh, uh, Aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis are treated with Tavi. And then even uh, more uh, surprising, less than 65 years of age, this is out of guidelines, even out of US guidelines, there's 50% of these patients are already treated with Tavi in US. It's different in Europe. And this is, I pull these data out. Um, this is data uh, from, I, can, I could do it from, for 2021 in Copenhagen. So this is in my center. What did we do in 2021 of patients? You see, if you, if you were, uh, and below in red is surgical, Above the line is uh, Tavi, and I think in 2021 we did something like 450 Tavi in that year. Um, so you see, if you were above 80, you were almost sure you were going to end up with Tavi, and there was almost no surgical offer for these patients. Between 75 and 80, you see already their penetration. Now I'm talking already two years ago, penetration of Tavi was high. In the age group between 70 and 75, it was kind of 50-50. And then, uh, for sure, if you were below 65, you see that the absolute majority was, was uh, treated with surgery. And you see also the, the color coding in, in uh, dark red or dark blue is if you're a bicuspid or not. And you see, of course, there's much more bicuspids in these younger patients. So that's another animal we have to learn to treat correctly in the, in the next couple of years if Tavi is moving in this younger population group. And what is the last driver for growth in the next decade? I think we will see, we will do more cases also for Tav and Tav. Uh, that's one thing, because we will see these younger patients which we treated coming back for a re-intervention. Re and also another um, is the pure AR. That's typically patients we do not treat yet. Uh, maybe we have to wait for the correct devices too, but that's still uh, typically in 10-15% of the patients uh, of getting aortic valve replacement in a center, uh, or at least in my center, is because of uh, aortic regurg. So that's a pot potential extra growth factor. Thank you very much. Very yeah. So uh, coming back to your data, Ole, uh, and it's uh, a question for you, OE. We've seen that below 65, there is already almost 50% of the patients who undergo TAVI in the US. So how do you manage that? What is the main driver? Is it uh, the will of the patient or how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, I think, as you know, the guidelines are a little different in the US than in Europe, in which uh, 
the recommendation is more for shared decision making in the age population from 65 to 80. And shared decision making often means that the patient preference to, is taken into account. And it's a very rare patient, of course, who you describe open heart surgery to, at least when I describe open heart surgery, sawing open the chest and tearing <laughs> apart the sternum, et cetera, who chooses to have open heart surgery over TAVR. And so that is one of the drivers. I don't think it's really 50% under 65. It's more 50% under 70. Um, and I think a lot of those, of course, are bicuspid valves, where bicuspid valves are still a lot more controversy over what the right therapy is, and it's particularly when we're thinking about valve and valve and durability. So, so often overlooked also in the European guidelines, there is not a clear cut of a 75, but there's also the informed wish of the patient, which has put a class one recommendation. And this is also mm -hmm. a lot of argument with the caregivers, but with the insurance companies, of course, how these guideline recommendations are actually put into action. But if we go into this age group, what about, uh, Howard, what about the hemodynamics? What do we have to do mm -hmm. actually to support these patients? We've seen Tav and Tav by Ola is one situation, and we have 1.5 million uh, TAV implantations out in the world already, and the number is growing. We know that the population at risk tri triples uh, at the age level one decade more. If we go from 65 to 75, if we go to 85, uh, we again have a doubling of the prevalence of the disease, and we anticipate in Europe and also in Germany that we'll see 70% more patients actually with aortic stenosis in the next 15 years in total numbers. So what can we do about the durability, about hemodynamics? Can you give us some insights, Howard? Sure, uh, thanks. So hemodynamics really involves two things. One is the initial hemodynamics of the valve and how that affects the patient. So that's the concept that we all are aware of now, prosthesis patient mismatch and not putting in too small a valve for the patient's cardiac output requirements. And that is an important characteristic that we've learned in the surgical world, that if you have severe prosthesis patient mismatch, you're at risk for cardiac mortality, almost a six-fold excess within five years. Uh, you have less mass regression, more uh, risk of, of having adverse coronary flow reserve, uh, impaired quality of life. So you add the survival and the quality of life factors together, and we really want to avoid severe PPM, and that's the importance of hemodynamics and giving, getting the largest possible valve with the biggest effective orifice area possible. And then there is data that you know of both in the surgical world and in the TAVR world that hemodynamics affects durability. And so for these younger patients, we want to make sure that they have the largest valve that gives them the longest chance of having no structural valve deterioration. Here you see on the slide uh, some data from the low-risk Evolute versus surgery trial, which demonstrated the superior hemodynamics of the superannular self-expanding Evolute valve in comparison to surgical valves uh, maintained out to three years. And we have data from trials like Notion, which has even eight-year follow-up data showing that structural valve deterioration is less with TAVR valves at eight years. Again, probably based to a great extent on the improved hemodynamics of the superannular valves. And although the difference there is relatively small, uh, mean gradient difference of about 12 versus 9 doesn't sound like much, it's really the edges of those curves that matters. So these are bell-shaped curves, and the tail of the curve, where gradients are more than 20 millimeters, let's say, are fourfold different. So uh, despite the fact that the mean here looks fairly similar but slightly different, the instance of gradients greater than 20 is fourfold difference. It's 4% versus 16%. And we have very little data on valve-to-valve -valve comparisons in the TAVR world. What we have are TAVR versus surgery, different trials with TAVR versus surgery, and we can't really compare them one-to-one. -one. They had different operations, they had different valves, different patient populations. That's the importance of trials like SMART which I have mm -hmm. the privilege of being the principal investigator for. This is the first randomized trial that's going to compare the Sapien balloon expandable valve with the Evolute self-expanding valve. We've enrolled over 700 patients now at more than 90 cents, a third of them from here in Europe and the Middle East. And uh, the results are in follow-up now. We hope to be able to present those less than a year from now. And we have two co-primary endpoints there, a clinical one, and also a bioprosthetic valve dysfunction endpoint based on hemodynamics. 
Thank you very much. And now we want to move <laughs> over to see this. Actually, we'll also see it in the live case. Uh, what influences the sequence and the criteria of valve selection? It's, I think, a very important point. It's not only that we want to implant in a native situation the first valve, but we also have to make sure the younger the patient is, uh, DDA, the more we care for the ongoing out of our knowledge now. Of course, the knowledge may be different in 10 years, but what do we, how do we respect the next procedure? So that's uh, definitely a contemporary, uh, contemporary concern, and to uh, to make it sure that's going to, because it's going to be the focus of the life transmission. Uh, but clearly, as we are treating patients with a longer and longer life expectancy, we need to think about the second and potentially the third uh, procedure. So several things have to be put into uh, into balance, uh, as you can see on the slide. So it's not about describing that; it's more about understanding for a single patient what is going to be the, f the best first procedure in the X1, then the second, already planning potentially for the third one. And if you uh, I go to the next slide, mm -hmm. something that m seems very important to me is to understand what is the real life expectancy of the patients that we are treating every day. And we may have uh, misconceptions about the true life expectancy of a patient with significant severe our extenosis, as you can see that if we take this, uh, let's go into the middle, the low risk patient, 80 years old, the, the life expectancy is only eight to 10 years. And if you go down uh, towards the, the lower uh, edge of the slide, 70 years old uh, at low risk, it's only 12 to uh, 13 years. So this, has to, this is the basis for reflection uh, concerning the first, uh, the index procedure, the type of the device or technique that we're gonna utilize. But the patients are not going to survive so long that they, they should require two or three procedures. Two is going to be common, three we're going to see in the future. Thank you, DDA, for this uh, very precise uh, evaluation. We want to move on to Vasilis, actually, to see uh, what is uh, about the durability of the prosthesis and what about the individual uh, age selection? What should we do and what age step? Can you elucidate a little bit on this uh, on this slide? Yeah, I mean, th that has been uh, the plague of the interventional cardiologists to try and prove to patients and to surgeons that the valves are as durable as theirs. And I think we're very all very grateful to the investigators of the Notion trial that had the insight such a long time ago to recruit lower risk patients that won't have a big attrition for mortality so we can have a little look at this in more depth. And you can see there in the now eight year follow up structure of valve deterioration that is much, much significantly much lower in the TAVI population compared to the surgical group. I would say nearly half uh, the amount of uh, valves in the TAVI group seem to be affected by structural valve deterioration. And we also now have the five year data from uh, the SURTAVI trial and the core valve US pivotal uh, merged to together. And again, you can see in a very large population there that nearly a half of the patients with TAVI have um, biprosthetic valve dysfunction. And most importantly, those that appear to get it, then they have worse outcomes. So if you see that little dotted plot just below there, things like death, cardiovascular mortality, are all um, in, f in favor, let's say, not in favor, but actually harm patients that have this biprosthetic valve uh, f uh, dysfunction. And then, not to mention that already in the three-year low-risk trial data, you can already see um, the uh, evolutes performing a little bit better than surgery. And let's see how these lines carry on in the future, because I'm, I'm sure that, you know, biprosthetic valve dysfunction has an impact on uh, valve function and then on outcomes further down the line. Thank you, Vasilis, very much. And we now directly move into something that's always critical to understand actually all these slides. And I now <laughs> hand over to DDA to go into the patient presentation of the life case. And I think it's best to learn all these things yeah, we discussed. So it's going to be a very, uh, very interesting uh, uh, patient. And that 100% uh, matches the, the contemporary concern that we have because we are treating lower risk patients, longer life expectancy as we all discussed. So we need to think about what is going to be the first procedure for this patient and how to uh, better anticipate the next one. So uh, this is a young patient, young lady, 73 years old, slightly overweight, uh, with symptom severe symptomatic aortic stenosis with a NYHA class 3 diaspnea, as you can see. Uh, as a past history, medical history, a relevant one is uh, some uh, neurologic event three, more, three months before uh, our admission, otherwise nothing special. 
So laboratory stand, uh, stand, uh, from the laboratory standpoint, uh, you can see that the anti-proBNP is not that high. The renal function is preserved. Uh, so um, no real uh, anemia, and nothing uh, noticeable. And from the ECG standpoint, a slightly prolonged PR uh, interval. Otherwise, nothing special. So 73 quite a regular patient, low, uh, low risk patient. So uh, echo, echo wise, so preserved LVF, some degree of uh, concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, okay, as you can you, uh, appreciate on the moving uh, image, LVF 63, and all the matrix in favor of a significant severe aortic stenosis for this patient. Nothing special at the level of the coronary arteries. This is part of the decision making for every single patient. So these are the risk scores for this patient, clearly uh, putting that lady at uh, low risk for, for surgery and no clear uh, element in favor of uh, frailty apart from the uh, five uh, meter uh, gate speed. So this is a summary of the patient, 73, symptomatic, no coronary artery disease, preserved LVF, low risk for surgery, and as you can see, uh, as you're going to see in a couple of uh, seconds, small aortic annulus and normal peripheral uh, vasculature. So uh, we went through the, the, as we do usually, uh, through the metrics uh, of the CT scan for this patient, and you can see that the mean perimeter derived diameter of the annulus on the left part of the, the slide is 23.4. If you match it uh, with the uh, LVOT on the right part of the slide, it's slightly a tapered configuration, and that tells us about the hypertrophic uh, aspect nature of the left ventricle. The, the LVOT is smaller than the annulus, so one could anticipate difficulty in properly landing the device at target with a tendency to go up. So we're going to see how it is uh, through the case, uh, through the case, uh, and it can also impact the final valve uh, uh, size choice. Uh, the bigger you are, the more likely uh, to go upwards you will be. So if you will see in the middle of the, the slide, the sinus of Valsava is not that large. The annulus is more in favor of a 29. Uh, narrow sinuses, LVOT slightly smaller than the annulus. Uh, if we, as uh, Howard has mentioned, if you try to, to anticipate uh, uh, the outcomes for uh, the patient integrating the hemodynamics, and that is a clear advantage of this self-expanding supranular platform, uh, you can see that for a 23 analyst, you have the choice between a 26 and a 29, and that, that is never going to put the patient at risk of severe patient prosthesis mismatch, but you can achieve an indexed uh, erythrocyte area larger with the uh, 29 uh, evolute propolis. So we're going to see what the, the site has uh, said selected, 26 or 29. The coronary arteries are quite wide. The sinuses of Valsava are not that big, but we have a kind of flared takeoff of the coronary arteries, uh, getting away slightly from the projection of the leaflets. Uh, so potentially the risk of coronary obstruction is not that high. So it's more about what is going to be time in time in the future for, for this patient. These are the, the projection, uh, cusp of lab projection and free cusp of coplanar as it is required for contemporary practice and normal peripheral vasculature. So, so ideal situations actually for yeah. an intervention, but also a surgical candidate uh, by the risk profile uh, and the age, of course, uh, at least for the European standards. But I'm happy to now uh, get uh, the FART Center in Leipzig into action. And it's my great pleasure to announce Mohamed Abdul Wahab and Philip Kiefer. Uh, from the center who will now go into the key objective strategy tools and techniques of their intervention hello to leipzig yeah good afternoon from uh, leipzig to paris uh, good to see you all again or to hear you um so uh, we'll we'll move straight forward to the uh, objectives and strategy of this case that we've just seen presented by the da these are our disclosures so the objectives are actually to appreciate the possibilities for what we call streamlining a transfemoral TAVI procedure, to understand deployment steps of an Evolute Pro Plus THV, and also, and this is important to discuss, procedure optimization in patients with a longer life expectancy such as this lady. The strategy we have chosen here, uh, I mean, I know we were going to discuss also um, surgical options in this case uh, and the different transcatheter options we have, but what we decided here is a minimalist and safe approach. So this is procedures being done under local anesthesia in a hybrid operating room 
We have already punctured the radial artery for angiography and we did an ultrasound guided puncture of the left femoral artery in this case. We have chosen the left femoral artery because the bifurcation is higher on the right. And we uh, opt, despite the minimalist approach, to use a venous axis and a temporary pacemaker in uh, still a large proportion of our, of our patients for safety issues. This can also be, of course, discussed whether this is necessary or not. Um, importantly, we want to also to optimize THV implantation not only for the acute setting, but also for the long-term setting. And this is important because it could lead to some modification of implantation technique. So we've pre-closed with one pro-style. We are going, we are planning a, a small balloon pre-dilatation because of the high gradient and the presence of asymmetric calcification, which is some um, more or less um, um, yeah, um, cumbersome, at least uh, for the full expansion of the Evolute Pro Plus that we have chosen. So we might expect some paravalvular leak, and we have chosen actually the Pro Plus 26. We have thought a lot because it's a gray zone uh, in between a 26 and a 29. We usually tend to take the larger valve in a gray zone. In her particular case, we opted for the smaller valve because we want to place it a little bit deeper considering her longer life expectancy and we will show this in a minute why this is important and we think because of the LVI hypertrophy that it will be a bit easier to place this valve a, a bit deeper than a larger valve. The LVOT is very uh, small and also the anatomy all in all the sinuses are okay but they are not huge. Yes. Uh, we're going to use the cusp overlap technique and we'll try to do commissure alignment, which is also important in younger patients. And there's a few slides for you guys who are not familiar with the uh, concept of, as, as mentioned, we have to think of the possibility that this lady may need a second device at a later time point. And we tend maybe to think of the shorter frame valves in patients that have longer life expectancy because probably retreating them would be easier. On the other hand, we would risk some patient prosthesis mismatch in small anatomies. And this is exactly the case here. So she has a small anatomy. Taking a small short device could be probably easier for long-term redo procedures. But on the other hand, th at least theoretically, this device may end up with some PPM and may degenerate faster. So um, it is possible, of course, to do redo procedures with, with longer self-expanding devices, but you need to un understand that implanting a second valve, which is usually will be a shorter valve, would lead to a functional neoskirt that you can modify its height by implanting this new device at different levels. So the higher you implant, the longer will be the neoskirt. The deeper you implant, the shorter will be the functional neoskirt, but you will have some leaflet overhang. We can simulate this, so maybe we show this uh, on the next slide. We can simulate this more or less, and this, these are simulations done by the FEOPS uh, um, technology. And you can see here, this is a 26 Evolute implanted on the left-hand side at 2 millimeter, which would be the usual, and on the right-hand side at a deeper a position five millimeter. And you can see here that if you implant a, a second device, this is just what we think for the future. At the same position, you will have the same leaflet overhang, but still you will have less overlap with the coronaries. You are maintaining coronary axis um, if you implant the initial valve at a little bit deeper position. And this is summarized also on the next slide. You can simulate this and calculate and see how much overlap you're going to have with the coronaries, which is, we're just showing this. Um, 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 this is new and probably this is, um, I think the first or the second time this is being shown, but just it, to demonstrate what we know uh, in a more clear way, when you're implanting the first valve, you probably need to think about how you implant it and try to keep options open for the future. Um, the last I chose our team. So uh, Philip Kiefer is a cardiac surgeon. Uh, as you know, we have Aniruda Janai, an anesthesiologist taking care of the patient. We have Annette and Katya and Robert, who is a perfusionist crimping the valve. And we have Ahmed as our medical coordinator. 
Uh, we'll just summarize what we did so far. So uh, we were waiting until we were waiting, or while we were waiting to go online, we punctured the radial artery, we punctured the femoral artery. It's uh, the, the right groin has not been punctured, at least up till now. And we did one angiogram. Maybe we can show this because it also gives you an idea about the anatomy. You can see here this eccentric calcification on the acoronary cusp. This is the three cusp view, by the way. And the anatomy doesn't appear to be extremely big. Um, and we will proceed now with crossing the valve life with you guys. Feel free to, to discuss or uh, um, ask questions, and we'll just continue to work. Thank you very much, Mohamed. I think you raised very important points in getting to the question of how the leaflet overhang or the implant technique, the height of the primary implant, will actually influence the situation for the next operator in this patient, which is anticipated after 10, 15 years, hopefully the longer. Um, but we can make his life easier, and there are two or three components that you outlined, and this is commissural alignment, so a leaflet modification possibility, but also the situation, how much leaflet overhang situation we have. So do you plan to implant this valve now in your optimal scar that you showed at the last point, uh, a little bit deeper, and how deep do you want to implant this valve? So you chose the smaller valve, so the discussion was um, whether you take an effective orifice area of 1.9 or 1.75. It's a small difference, but there mm. is a difference. Didier showed this also nicely. Um, so how is your perspective there, and what will you do? What is the trade-off? What is the pacemaker rate situation in your cusp overlay? What is the uh, potential use for the next operator? Yeah, so yes, we, we are planning to go a bit deeper. Um, I can't tell you how deep exactly, because I think <laughs> um, I cannot be that precise, but um, we will try to be at five, maybe six millimeters, try not to go much deeper. Uh, also for um, the, um, the other side, or the flip side of going deeper, as you know, is um, the conduction issue. I mean, we measured here the membrane septum, which is something that we don't do in every case, but I, we thought that in this case it may be helpful to understand. And it's around four millimeter. Mm. So hmm, uh, we, can't, we can't really uh, say that going at five or six will, will be perfect from a pacemaker perspective. Uh, but this is, I mean, you, you need to, sometimes you need to do some compromises in life. Um, and the good thing is we are not starting with a conduction abnormality. So this is a patient that doesn't have, for example, pre-existing conduction abnormalities, which is good. So we think even if we go five to six, we have a chance to escape the pacemaker and we keep the way open maybe for the second procedure Senses. in case she needs Senses. it. I mean, it's, a, it's still questionable whether she will need it at all, uh, but we need to be prepared. Um, we we'll definitely also try to do some commercial alignment. Uh, it's easier probably with the FX, but we don't have the FX, so we're going to try to and do it with the Evolute Pro. Um, you so see the uh, hemodynamics, so uh, severe AS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can clearly uh, see the hemodynamics uh, more, and it's, uh, there is no doubt that this, uh, this lady requires an intervention. There is uh, uh, one uh, question coming from the uh, audience. Uh, it's uh, how do you balance the risk of pacemaker versus, versus future coronary access when you plan your implant death? We know we understood clearly that it's quite difficult to be extremely precise. We're going to see in the future if we get tools to achieve that. But how do you balance, uh, balance that? Pacemakers, future coronary access, we could even have uh, regurgitation because the deeper you are, the more likely to get a regurgitation you get. Uh, what seems more and more, more important for your, uh, your patients today? I mean, of course, everything is important. <laughs> um, <laughs> mm -hmm. We try to get um, the best we can from each and every anatomy. Um, it, it becomes complex in younger patients because really you don't want to have uh, you don't want to have them getting pacemakers. You don't want to have them getting issues with coronary access. You don't want to uh, want them uh, to degenerate. You don't want to have them to get PPM. 
So uh, you want to have redo procedures as well. But I mean, at some time point, we need to make some compromises. Um, yeah, I think yeah. a good compromise is that we chose the smaller valve yes. and the deeper position. I think this is the most yes. efficient way to, yes. to treat this. Yes. So I have uh, one, uh, one question for you guys. Um, it's all about uh, balance compromise because you are uh, about to use a small, the smaller valve size uh, being in the gray zone. And uh, in the past, we used not to predilate these that patients. Uh, just to get more frictions of the stand frame with the, uh, the surrounding anatomy and to get a good, uh, proper ceiling. So my question to you is, uh, do you always predilate or are there certain situations in which you don't predilate? And you're yeah. using a smaller balloon. So, uh, Perhaps you can elucidate a little yes. bit on the size of the balloon. Yes. So it's definitely that we tend to predilate much more than we did uh, a few years ago, so predilatation is like uh, it has been like uh, waves. We started by predilating everyone, and then we wanted to skip it in everyone. Now we predilate more. Have it pacing for um, With a very high gradient and very severe calcification, we want to predilate, ex especially if we have a self-expanding device, such in this case. We do the predilatation, and maybe we discuss uh, immediately afterwards the balloon size. It's a 20 balloon, by the way. Okay. Compliant balloon, but why what, we've chosen what size it. balloon? Uh, are you 20, 20, 20, make a bit 20. An. It's an. a 20 compliant balloon. Should knock on. It's fine. Yes. Balloon up. Balloon down. Facing off. Facing off. off. What you also see in this case, one of the good things about predilating is to free your wire a little bit in the oh, commissure between the non and the right. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I thought the deer will, uh, will notice this. I I'm sure that. he did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so and this is also important <laughs> if you want to place your device, yeah. Any room for uh, balloon angiography, a uh, concomitant angiogram where you inflate the balloon? I, I don't do it, to be honest. Um, Almost never, but yeah. never is probably the wrong wording, but we do it very rarely. We, we don't <laughs> really see the, a big advantage of the, of the angiogram during balloon inflation. I don't know how, how you guys uh, see this. So, uh, you do it, Didier, some, at, at, in some cases, correct? That's a, 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 question, a question for you, uh, Moel. Yeah, just, to, yeah. just a question, practical question. Do you normally use your temporary so. pacing wire in all cases or just for this one because you're anticipating to go a little bit lower and you have a PR that is at the border of 200 milliseconds and you just want to play it more safe? Or do you routinely... Yeah, to be honest, we're still a bit, uh, we're still a bit dinosaurs. We use it uh, <laughs> in a large number of... Druck bitte spülen. Use it in a large uh, proportion of patients. Uh, we tend to remove it quickly if we are happy and we, if we don't have conduction abnormalities, like uh, uh, don't leave it if it's not necessary. We pace on the wire in selected cases. Yeah. Uh, is there Druck an? No, not much. Just as a comment, but still I'm much more I, comfortable I, I by agree. doing it. Can we the Druck flash on the made there with the 26, I think the 29, the concern could exactly. even be because of the SCJ, which is really small, that this upper part Druck of the, uh, the stand frame would not be even fully deployed. And then you would, could even have, theoretically, an, uh, a little bit of pinwheeling of the leaflets, so you wouldn't gain that much in, in uh, effective in opening area, I think, with the 29, yeah. as, as set in the slide. And then the predilatation, I, I agree, I also tend to predilate more again, but a bit of conservative, smaller balloon, mm -hmm. it helps to get a better expansion, mm -hmm. less, yeah. uh, less uh, under expansion of the valve, also avoid uh, infolding if, if any. And um, also, if you do the final release of your valve, you, you typically have a better uh, anchoring already and less, less uh, movement of the valve, is my and, experience. And, and sometimes your mobility mm -hmm. and control of the height is better if you yeah. have predilated uh, mm -hmm. with an undersized balloon. Okay. Sure. Still, a larger valve is a larger EOA, right? Larger valve, larger Yeah, but let's EOA. say if the top of that stand frame doesn't fully expand because it's a narrow STJ, it will still be a little bit uh, yeah. compressed and then you may have even some pinwheeling of the leaflets yeah. or, or it won't open that much. I, I okay, like the okay guys, just, just one but second, we're, we're going to come back to yes, that yes. discussion because they're about to deploy the valve and it would be interesting to hear from you guys 
in Leipzig, your technique, uh, what are your landmarks, and what, what is the goal for this Loris patient? Yes. So uh, we first, I mean, this is the cusp of a lab view. It's a bit, um, uh, uh, not, not a, a usual one, so it's LAO codal, as you said, uh, the, the LAO2, so very shallow LAO, LAO and, and <laughs> some codal. Um, yeah, so almost a three cusp, but it's actually her, her cusp overlap. Yeah. And you can see her first, the, um, the hat marker. It would sure. be perfect if we were center front. So we are a bit malaligned, probably. I mean, we are in the front. If you go LEO, you see it on the outer curvature. And if you go again to the cusp overlap, so we are not exactly in the front. We may try to improve this a little bit, but I tend to avoid a lot of manipulation with the valve, um, just because you know it's a bit difficult to get it perfect with this generation. I mean, we will see it uh, maybe with uh, Danny's case that it's easier with the FX. So I'm, I'm, I'm not um, going to manipulate more than that. I tried, but then I will accept this. Okay, probably it will be at the end uh, a bit, a bit rotated. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes you have to pull back um, into the uh, into the descending aorta yes. in order to be able to turn. Yes. Uh, you're already right. dedicated, and your freedom of rotation is, of course, a little bit limited uh, in this uh, position. Yeah. Basically, we try to Pacing avoid severe malalignment, yeah. and severe malalignment does not exist in this particular morphology. So, I think it's good to go. So, so I'm so deploying one, very slowly. 130. 40. Yeah, and he's aiming to the 4, 5 millimeter, I guess. Yeah. And we can clearly already see how big the device seems for the anatomy, so 26. Exactly. Yeah, it was a good choice. Yeah. But, uh, but also you can okay. perhaps... Stop pacing a bit. Eh? Yeah. Tell a little bit how you do the wire management now and also the the pull-push maneuver that There's you're just a, doing at yeah. the moment, I see that. There's a lot of tension in, yeah. in the system. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so, yes, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a safari wire, so we're not using a Lundaquist routinely, such yeah. as in the United States. Uh, may, I, may, I ask you, uh, may I ask you more just to uh, rotate a bit the CRM to go to the free cusp planner? Uh, just to, uh, to make sure that you don't have any enfolding, you see in the non-coronary to the right coronary uh, region, Yes. Close to the guide where you're the patient to make sure yes. that they're. I just went in mm. there and. And if you fluoro, you record that? Unconscious. Yeah, so there's some, some infolding. Some, some degree, but some very minimal. Yeah. Yes. yes. But should be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Also, ceiling quite good already. Uh, yeah. Moment. Ceiling, yeah. It's sealing, yes, so it's, uh, it's sealing. The question is whether this is okay. I mean, the if depth. it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if we can keep it like that, probably it will be okay. But because of the small infolding uh, that Didier mentioned, it may be that the valve, while we release it, comes up a little bit, and then we end up higher than we wanted. So uh, this is something we need to maybe discuss. I'm going again to the... Uh, In the uh, cusp of a lap, Somewhere... Uh, in terms of Looks depth, in the cusp of a lap, it seems yeah. okay. You yeah. see, are, we, are yeah. you happy with that? Let's do an five. You, you also have some length yeah. to, to come up. It's in not extremely high. Ex so. Exactly, and we have the curve. You would I'm not as worried deploy about this with that. a I'm not as worried push. about being too high. So I think, mm. uh, I think this is a good placement. You have good ceiling. And it's expected with that degree of calcification in the norm. Also the fact that the valve is a little bit to the inner curvature yes. of the catheter, so you may expect that it will tilt, it will always yes. tilt according to the aorta, that maybe that NCC side will dive in a little bit, I think. Could uh, be, but there's the calcium also. We saw the, yeah, the impingement to the balloon, yeah. uh, so mm -hmm. there's also the strongest resistance for sliding up and down on the, on the outer curve. Huh? Yeah. It's good that they're centralizing now the valve, so they're pushing on the yeah. delivery system to actually see what happens, because you, you can play with So us. what you did, you pulled back your, your wire a little bit, and you pushed push a little it. bit on the system to get off the inner curve. Is that correct, exactly. Mo? Yeah. I'm trying to understand uh, yeah. whether I yeah. can yeah. modify more, something uh, in more the More coaxial, so yeah. it, should, yes. it should be more stable yes. during the final release of the outflow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's better. Okay. 
So, uh, Philip, what do you think? Well, if we stick to our plan, we should go a bit deeper, but I think the positioning and the ceiling is very good. I agree with the panel, so... Yeah, it seems uh, perfect. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's not perfect, a high-hand plan, so it's okay. perfectly exactly in, yeah. the, in the goal of what you, uh, you, you aim at initially. And we, also have to think, we also have to think like about that. the first <laughs> 10 to 15 years. Also there, the valve has to be perfect. So we, we should not only uh, put our perspective to the 15 the years in the future, <laughs> where we may have also different options yeah. that we're That's unaware right. of now. So, right. so, so, so I would, I would yeah, also opt totally for an agree. optimal result now. But I think well, when, when you know the, how yeah. to treat failed totally. bioprosthetic valves at risk, right? Yeah. <laughs> you will manage. I know, yes. <laughs> 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 Facing mal bitte vorbereiten auf 160 mal. 160. <laughs> I know, I know, Daniel, I know. But I think yeah. even with the, okay, with the so let's, uh, compensation of push of the device a little bit more central, it center. came yeah. a little bit down on that NCC yeah. side, yeah. so it Facing sits around that fight, I think. Um, so we have a relatively high pressure with 150 yeah. systolic. So let's see the, the, the final, uh, phase, yeah. bit more. final release. Yeah. Bringing down the pressure now Definitely. below 100. And it's good in this situation to keep the peak tail in place, even if you have a quite narrow uh, SOV. This way you can better understand the relationship, the depth of the device while you mm -hmm. uh, extrude the, uh, expose the outflow portion. And I like the way you, you do it very yeah, slowly. Very yeah. slowly very and slowly. you see that it comes down a little bit on the, on the outer curve. Very good. Not too much, uh, yeah, very not little. Much. Yeah, okay. it didn't come it's up. Pretty good. It's good. Yeah, it's sehr good. Sehr good. Aus. Aus. And it's off. It's genauso ah. mm -hmm. So now that your valve is released, you can take a deep breath. And we have lots of questions coming from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Screen is full. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't want to bother you during the, uh, the deployment, mm -hmm. but now it's time to answer that. Mm -hmm. Druck kommt gleich wieder. So there, there is a first uh, a comment, uh, uh, Mohamed, about the um, the infolding that w was observed. And don't you believe that uh, if you had reshift at that point, it would have become uh, worse, more infolding? Is it something could, that you've seen? It could seen? go both ways, yeah. I mean, it could go both ways. I mean, you, uh, infolding can happen. Uh, during resheathing, uh, even if you don't have initial enfolding, so yeah. with each resheathing you can you can get some enfolding. Mm. But on the other hand, if it's the, if the cause is the position, uh, then you may um, improve actually your enfolding by improving your position. So it can go th go in both directions. So I wouldn't say um, that it's only one way. Okay, we'll do some hemodynamics now. Wir können jetzt wieder den Druck spülen. Spülung. Danke, ist dran. Danke. So while you are uh, mm -hmm. connecting everything, while you are connecting everything for the hemodynamic assessment, there is one question mm -hmm. regarding the uh, measurement of the membrane septum length as a guidance or a tool to better predict the, um, the risk of permanent pacemaker for your patient. Is this something that you measure on a regular basis? I do not, just to, to disclose that, but I would like to... Uh, maybe we should. To <laughs> the DDR, maybe we should. Yeah, we should. yeah. you're going to tell me why afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm at> first. <laughs> to be honest, we don't. Huh? Wow, superb. Yeah. Yes, so that's very good. Wow. But this, you could expect that. So to be honest, we don't. Look at to the be yeah, honest, we so don't that's, measure uh, yeah. Hemodynamic wise, it's, uh, it's great. So you already get an applause as you hear <laughs> here from Paris. It's not uh, finished yet. But <laughs> I know, but uh, I think the vessel was not that bad to, to close yeah. it. But uh, so, do you so measure the membrane of septum length? Uh, the question is for me. Yeah. So we don't measure it routinely. Uh, I don't want to lie. We don't measure it routinely. We measure it in selected patients, um, like in this patient where we just want to understand. Do we have the freedom, for example, to go a bit deeper or not? Uh, we think that maybe patients also with the right bundle bench block could be patients where it's uh, worth measuring, uh, because these patients obviously have a highest risk of conduction abnormalities. 
but to be honest, we don't measure it routinely. Um, this is now interesting. I'm now in the cost overlap view. I'll it's make a cine for that. You have the perfect yeah, uh, uh, line. It's, it's, be sure it's, that it's aligned. It's yeah. nicely aligned, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So despite the fact that I wasn't very happy with the catheter, but it's good. The other thing you see, and this is also interesting because I don't have a big experience with FAOPS, but these guys did uh, like the usual analysis also for this case, not only the one with the redo procedure, but the usual looking at frame deformation, paraviral leaks and so on. And they actually predicted this sort of deformation coming from the non-coronary side. Mm. Uh, but they also predicted with the 26, um, without uh, um, taking post dilatation into account, a rather big paraviral leak, uh, like I, I think 13, 14 milliliters. Mm -hmm. so, so let's see whether we have it or not. So the frame deformation, at least the prediction was correct. So you're challenge challenging Theops. Mm. I'm challenging Theo. Yeah. <laughs> on the PVL, you may be right. Huh? <laughs> I'm you on chess. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful no, it's, result. It's, it's less than 30. So perfect. Perfect yeah. result. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So now we can applaud. Mm -hmm. Nice. Have me. <laughs> yeah, that's I think perfect. If you also perfect. look at where the coronaries uh, come <laughs> from and where they have landed, so I think we don't have issues with access, we Maybe are aligned. you can repeat it in LA or cranial uh, that we can like predict, if you like a yeah, the left side view. Fortunately, the renal function is, uh, is good for this patient, so maybe you can yeah. get an LA cranial mm -hmm. view just to see the relationship of the stent frame with the um, ostium of the left main. I you will. The 26 will. was a good so choice. Yeah, perfect choice, the 26, yeah. Okay, Angie nochmal. And tschüss. And the commissure alignment, you can see the C pad towards us. So. Yeah. Same. So we Wonderful. see the leaflet. There is still room yeah. uh, between the stand frame and the, uh, the true osteum of the left man that you can see in that yes. LAO cranial. So it's a question about sinus sequestration, yeah. but it's a borderline situation. It needs to be reviewed. In but the future, maybe on, the, on the right, on the right. Yeah. Mohamed, can you freeze this image when there is contrast? We can count it. Yes. You can count to node four, and then you mm. can almost project if you would align there the top of your sapien. I think it will be below the, the left main, to be honest. Yeah. So if we look, yeah, there one, two. So that's two full diamonds. Yeah, you yeah. come just at the bottom of the left main. Just so you below, would yeah. not overlap the left main. Mm -hmm. Normally. Yeah. Yeah. No. But I would argue, we are talking about lifetime management of patients, right? We want the best for our patients, not for the next year, but for a decade, two decades, and forever. But I wonder how much should we compromise on our procedures thinking about the future, right? It's a pendulum. We started to think about lifetime management, but should we compromise a lot about conduction, about uh, the, the need for pacemakers, about uh, hemodynamics? thinking about the future. Uh, God I knows what will happen in five or 10 years. We'll have many tools that we maybe not have now, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Denny, I agree. I made this point before. Uh, we should aim in the first place for a perfect result, like we have it here. And we should try to enable a little bit, but we should not only look into the future, we should look in the next 10 to 15 nice, years. Nice. And there we should avoid the prosthesis mismatch. There we should avoid the PVL. We know that this is outcome relevant. And if we can, we should avoid the pacemaker, not because it's an over mortality, but it's an additional device. And if it's not necessary, it's better. Did he, what do you think? So I think just so, uh, yeah, it's always very good important news to, uh, if we show the to make sure that at the index you get the best. Yeah. We do not but advocate for 10 millimeter depth no, no, no. to prevent uh, coronary obstruction you have in a 10 years. This valve has superb durability results, right? We know that. We've seen I that mean, we need to focus data, yeah. first on the success of our procedure. We do not need to ignore the future, but this is a secondary Thing that we need to think. And that was a perfect illustration. So, because we are all always talking about getting higher and higher and higher, because it's going to get, you're going to get a, a low pacemaker rate, no regurgitation. But it's really about tailoring the device choice first, and the device type and sizing to the patient, and the procedure to the patient. And here it was a perfect example. Uh, no compromise at the index procedure, getting the best outcome. Uh, but being a little bit deeper, if you make sure that you don't get any regurgitation or pacemaker, I think it's not a, it's, it's a, good, it's a quite good outcome. Yeah, I, I wanted you to have a look at the ECG. Uh, she had, 
some widening of the QRS complex that is resolving now. So this is her own rhythm. So fortunately, no, at least no high degree EV block now. Um, and the complex is getting a little bit narrower again. So um, we may get out of that without a pacemaker. Which is, which is good. So you made a perfect case and, uh, we, and we showed didn't, that... Then uh, we didn't do any compromise. Yeah. We, we trust you on the closure of the vessel as we have no calcification on the excess vessel, uh, Mo. So congratulations. Uh, we already had two rounds of applause for your case. <laughs> uh, and Thank I would like, so in order to also see the second Life in the Box case, uh, uh, we would then say farewell to Leipzig. Congratulations on this excellent case. And I would like to summary that we've seen a minimalistic approach situation in an extremely low risk patient with excellent excess situations. We saw all components of cusp overlay a perfect commercial alignment. Now we were discussing this. We saw pre-dilatation and this eccentric calcification of this valve. I think um, a lot of discussion and points that we would not have addressed in such a session five years ago, but that we're focusing on very much now in 2023. I think that's a good point that we have enough capacity now to look beyond the procedure and to think ahead uh, like in congenital heart disease, actually for the lifetime management of the patient. I think that's a very new term and a very important topic to focus on. And we've seen that in a 30-minute transmission, we can discuss about the case five to six minutes and still do the case in 25 minutes. So this was an excellent performance, Mo, and we, we see you there uh, now closing also the vessel. So you even get these minutes on your transmission time to see that. And uh, yeah. any last words from you? Before, uh, yes, uh, before uh, saying goodbye, because this is the last case this year from Leipzig, I wanted first, of course, to thank the patient, the patients we did this year for allowing us to, to do this uh, educational live case uh, session or sessions uh, with their help, with their support. And uh, moreover, I would like to thank the team, the whole team here in Leipzig, as you know, this is an extremely busy center. So uh, all of these people who are staying here late in the evening while the other labs and other operating rooms are still running with a lot of cases and a lot of emergencies. So thank you for them as well for supporting us in order to be able to what deliver, mean, hopefully, an educational I mean. message. So thank you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you to the team. Thank you, Mo. Thank you, Philip, uh, for this excellent collaboration. And now that we have implanted the valve, I would like to hand over to Ole, actually, and to discuss the next point. What about the discharge now of this patient? We've seen that we had only a widening of the QRS complex. We mm -hmm. had a risk in the four millimeter membrane septum. Uh, of a pacemaker, we went around it. Uh, we have a pointer for you and a clicker, so that once you start your presentation, you're able to do this from your yep. position. Yes. Uh, what would you say, how is now the situation after the procedure? What should we do? We, we have quite a diversity in Europe. Uh, uh, we're running some fast discharge trials here. I can tell you that different countries in Europe act differently, so what's your perspective? Yeah, sure. So let's bring the slides up, maybe. Okay, okay there's some lag, but I can already start. Well, in, the, in clearly this patient, uh, so this was a, a very uh, smooth, uncomplicated procedure. So what can you do in order to get uh, to work on an early discharge program in your, uh, in your center? And I think, uh, first of all, I cannot emphasize enough that this is, it works for us in Copenhagen. Uh, to get two-thirds or almost nearly 70% of patients out the day after next day discharge. But this is only possible because of real great teamwork. I mean, I'm just a very small part of this. Um, I just simply execute this case uh, and I have to do this as good as I can as uh, Mo was doing in Leipzig with uncompl uncomplicated without any um, complications and with, with no conduction problems, uh, ideally. But the biggest effort goes actually um, to the TAVI nurse specialist or the TAVI uh, coordinator. She's, she's really key in, in, in getting this done. And how does she do it? Well, first of all, it already starts, if you think of 
early discharge or next day discharge, it always starts before the case. So the, the nurse, the TAVI specialist nurse, she has uh, the contact with the patient and she kind of makes a triage. She says this is an, a patient which is suitable for it. This is a more higher risk or complex patient. Um, and then she can make her case planning. Of course, she does this in, uh, after discussing with us. So that case planning is already important. Also, what we learned over the years is that you have to align expectations of the patients. In the beginning, patients got an information uh, brochure home after their first intake uh, uh, discussion about you will get a TAVI in four to six weeks, and then it was written in uh, you will hospitalize for two or three or five days. And then they come to the case, uh, and then they come with the expectation to be hospitalized for three to five days. So if then suddenly you say, now the day after, you can go home, patients, these elderly patients, they were not prepared for it, not mentally, not practically, so that didn't work. So it's about ex aligning expectations. If you inform, you expect that your patient can go home the day after, you align the expectations, and then you can also take the pre-measurements. Even these TAVI uh, nurses, they help in checking whether there will be maybe an, a daughter who can take after uh, for the food, for the cleaning of the house, these practical issues, if you don't have these in order, you can also not just get the patient out the next day. So that's really key in order to, to be able to do this. Of course, then, as I said, you have to do your minimalistic uh, TAVI approach. So no general anesthesia, just local anesthesia, uh, no other uh, unnecessary things like deep venous uh, uh, catheters and all this, or bladder catheters, you just don't do this. And then, uh, Afterwards, then the patient standard post TAVI care. The next slide I will go a little bit more in detail, but that's important. Where does this patient go in the hospital? In hospital, right after the after the procedure, and what do you do with that patient? And then I would say that's very standardized. We try to keep this very standardized, so it's for every patient the same, and there's no discussion, unnecessary discussions, or too many phone calls within the hospital for from the nurses to us. What with this patient? What with that patient? It's very standardized. But of course, the day you send the patient home, then of course you have to look to the needs of these patients and then you give some clinical follow-up tapered to the needs of the patients. Some patients, if they're young and fit, you, you just tell them, okay, you just have to come to, or to your referring hospital in 30 days for your control, echo, or if it's an elderly patient, um, you which maybe a small complication, vascular complication was solved, but then you tell them like, look, if you, you can maybe come to the ambulatory with us in a week, or I give you a telephone call after three days. Um, so that's all very important. But what about that standardized post-TAVI care? Well, uh, so the patient is done. I would say m all our patients, almost only the non-transfemoral TAVI patients not, but otherwise all patients, they go to the regular ward, so no use of ICU, no use of CCU. There is in the regular ward in the room where the patient is uh, received, there's an in-room nurse surveillance for the first three hours after TAVI, um, just to see if everything is fine. There's no emergencies happening there from groin, from, from rhythm, etc. Of course, all patients on telemetry. We force the patients for early mobilization. In the past, we did it at six hours. Now, actually, we did, the, there was a nurse study and it's actually safe. They were, never had any problems with that. If you, you have to count, if you want to send the patient home the next day, you can't leave that patient the whole day after of the TAVI in his bed. And then suddenly the morning after you say, now you go home. No, you have to see that that patient mobilizes, that there's no vascular uh, oozing, etc. Uh, so that's really important that you mobilize these patients quickly. We make always a next day decision on the, on the pacemaker. So no unnecessary long hospitalizations for three, five days just to observe on the rhythm. No, we take a decision, yes or no pacemaker. And then also it's important that you give that patient proper uh, information what after this discharge. They get even actually uh, an information brochure with him uh, with things that may happen if they feel uh, dizziness, if they see some ooze in the groin, what to do, how to react, who to contact. So the patient feels very safe. Uh, he, he's not feel, he doesn't feel like he's pushed out of the hospital. He knows exactly, he has some instructions what to act, what to do if this, this happens. Uh, and then he feels safe to go home the next day. Very good, Olde. I, I like the idea of a standardized procedure and also a transmission to a normal ward or a heart valve unit. Uh, what's your um, uh, strategy on this, Magdalena, uh, in Munich? What do you do? Uh, how can we improve the, the situation with the transcatheter, but also uh, with your interventions? What do you do to standardize this uh, going home process? 
So we're limited a little bit with um, the infrastructure at our hospital. We would like to do something like um, like Ola is doing. Our patients do go to the uh, intensive care unit, but they're most commonly fast tracked on the same day. So they're, we we look for uh, mobilization as well, and of course uh, conduction disturbances. And um, so we've kind of standardized it with the infrastructure that we have, similar to what what you have, just not quite that streamlined yet. Okay, Vasilis, what about you? Yeah, it, we, we do like to send people home the next day or after two days if possible, but we are plagued at the moment by a massive inflow of inpatients. So what we mm -hmm. notice in England is that we are falling behind being able to treat outpatients. And whereas it used to be at 10 to 15 percent of our total TAVI load, now the inpatients have become something like 40 percent. And that's actually impacting on the discharge because they have a lot of other issues. They presented, they compensated, et cetera. But that model is what we also kind of follow up. Didier, what's the situation in France and your side? Also high volume, so yeah, it's the, we have the same concern because we are, we need to absorb this overload of patients. So find ways to make sure that the procedure is safe, that we don't compromise the immediate outcomes, and to be able to admit new patients, you need to discharge quite early the the actual the current ones. So uh, we are working towards day one, day two. Day two is quite frequent at our uh, hospital. Day one, it's really, it really depends on the patient. So we are trying to tailor to, uh, the decision to each individual patient. The vast majority of the cases, uh, such as OLA, if a pacemaker is required or we think that there might be an indication, the patient gets the pacemaker the next day. Perfect. So we're totally in time. So I'd like to hand over to Danny, actually, uh, to start with his recorded case now. Perfect, thank you. So we can uh, put the slides on and just uh, I'll describe briefly. So we started uh, working with the Evolute FX uh, platform and uh, I'm, I've, I'm very happy with the platform and the device. It's a redesigned tip and redesigned capsule and we have fluoroscopic uh, markers uh, and maybe we'll just uh, go ahead and see the slides. You can just open it. Yes, yeah. you have the clicker. We yeah. just have to make sure, just to add one remark, that mm -hmm. this is, of course, a device that is CE mark pending, as we show this in Europe. It's available in the United States. It was available for this implant in Israel, but uh, it's not yet CE mark. Uh, we're expecting so. this, hopefully, uh, at the second half of this year. So, so we're looking a little bit into the future here. And now, uh, Danny, please tell us here. So maybe without further ado, we'll just uh, see the recorded case. Hello, PCR. Welcome to Shahar Tzedek Medical Center in Jerusalem. I'm Danny Dvir, and uh, with me, Rami Juaba, and Anna Turian, Elias Hilu, and also Nesia, and Karmit, Yossi, and uh, Yafa. And we are uh, pleased to show you a very interesting case. So, please, Elias. So, we are presenting an 85-year-old male with hypertension and obesity, and, no, and he has no known ischemic heart disease previously with chronic renal failure and the serum creatinine level is 1.4 milligram per deciliter. This patient has severe aortic stenosis with, with normal left ventricular ejection fraction. His aortic valve is three leaflets. The area is 0 0.7 centimeters square. The maximal gradient is 96 millimeter and the mean gradient is 61 millimeter of mercury. There's nothing special in the iliofemoral arteries and we can appreciate the aortic valve anatomy via CT. We can see that there is a severe stenosis of the three leaflets of the aortic valves, as well as left ventricular outflow, outflow tract calcification. And we can see that there is a severe stenosis of the coronary arteries, especially for the left main coronary artery, as we can appreciate on the CT scan. Calcification is very diffuse, and it also extends to the aortic arch. The anatomy gives us dimensions of 80.7 millimeters of perimeter, and we can uh, appreciate the LVOT calcification, and we, we will take some considerations later on. Our case planning is to do coronary angiography, to approach via femoral artery, and left radial artery for multi multipurpose catheter for positioning. We are planning to perform pre-dilatation pre with 20 millimeter balloon, over the wire pacing, and TAVI with Evolute FX, 29 millimeters. Probably we will need post-dilatation with 23 millimeter balloon. We'll see the case together. 
אבסולוטלי, so extremely, extremely calcified aortic valve, one of the worst conditions extending to the LVOT. So Rami, maybe you'll describe what uh, we did until now? Yeah, actually with the setup uh, for our patient, the deep sedation, and we have the radial axis actually, and we try to do it as minimalist as we can. So we are going from the radial artery for the multipurpose, mm-hmm. and we have also the femoral axis, which is ultrasound guided. Always we are using with ultrasound guidance to reduce the risk in this procedure and for the femoral artery. And it will be with a brick closure with a one bro glide and angel seal for the leg. And we have now 14 French uh, sheet in the uh, right femoral artery. Uh, the pacing itself will be over the... With only one pro glide. With one pro glide, yeah. Yes. With one pro glide. And the uh, pacing will be over the wire pacing uh, to reduce uh, the risk for another access in this situation. So we'll just describe briefly that we, we didn't know the coronary angio of the patient before the procedure and we understood that uh, he has, as you saw, a lot of calcification. And as you can appreciate, uh, there is a critical also left main stenosis and the uh, osteal LAD. Uh, so, yes. and if you can appreciate the hemodynamics of the patient, if you can see the screen, we have a peak to peak, which is like more than a hundred. It's like yeah. 150, 150 yeah. peak to peak. This is a true extreme AS with good systolic LV function. So left main disease, extreme AS. I think that AS treatment should be the first and not the coronary treatment. He needs both, yeah. but probably the TAVI, high risk TAVI first, and then PCI. So if yeah. we can focus on the table, this is Evolute FX. And uh, I must say that since we, the cases that we did already with that uh, device are superb and I'm, I'm very pleased with the device, we can understand uh, if you can focus with the camera, there is a redesigned tip for a more dilator-like uh, vessel access. It actually really looks like a, the end of a dilator. So uh, the access is uh, uh, much better. I feel it also. And there is a redesigned capsule for increased uh, flexibility. And here uh, we can understand the, the, uh, the, the flow evaluation of uh, the, the valve and the, we see symmetric uh, positioning, the paddles are, are in, there is minimal uh, infold and we yes. are good to go basically. Yeah, we good. can also understand that the, the, the device, the valve has the fluoroscopic markers. We will see them during the deployment and talk about them the three dots that you see at the upper part of the frame. So uh, we will show you also that uh, we've just crossed the valve, extremely stenosed valve with uh, a lot of calcification, not a conventional crossing, but uh, it uh, went uh, through eventually. And uh, now we are with a pigtail inside the valve and good to go. So let's have a safari wire. Obviously, we talked about that extreme calcification and we most probably will need to do post-deal. There is also possibility that during the pre-dilation, the patient will yeah. get uh, unstable. Yeah. We yeah. are going to do pacing over uh, the wire. So this is going to be connected to the patient. We are not going to a large balloon in this situation, Danny, because of the LVT, LVOT calcification. <laughs> so we and chose the, a very small balloon, right? relatively yeah. small, a 20 millimeter. It's uh, related to the minor axis mm-hmm. of the uh, annulus of the patient and the LVOT, which is around 20 millimeter mm-hmm. with a lot of LVOT calcification. It's quite conservative inflation. For sure, we would have done a pre-dilation in the, we do pre-dilation here because of the stream calcification. So please, uh, 180 pacing. Yeah. Okay, oh, the blood pressure is wrong, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, go down. Okay, go pacing down. Off. Stop pacing. Okay, looks good. Looks good. Patient is reasonably stable and we can go forward with the TAVI. Yeah, and see. This. So the device has a, a improved deliverability and flexibility because it has one spine instead of the two spines. And actually, when you try it in the model, it's quite amazing to see how it a, a uh, bends much better than the previous version and uh, to all directions. 
So we will uh, continue. The top hat is in a good position. We will just continue. The multi-purpose uh, moved a bit. We will need to correct it. So first, let's bring the valve just a bit above the aortic valve. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's do the beginning. Change the magnification, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, another mic, yeah. please. Small yeah. puff. Okay. Yeah, we can see the radio peak uh, point, yeah. the three. Yeah. Basically, uh, we aim to have the three dots which are positioned three millimeters uh, yeah. from the end at the annulus level. Let's stop for a second and take an injection, please. Okay. Yeah, it's slightly. It's, no, it seems good. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Okay. Yafa, if you can uh, do 120 pacing, please. Yeah. Let's take another injection. Please inject. Looks good. Yeah, it looks good. And we can see the one dot which is looking to the right side, Danny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is the best option for the commissure alignment. We yes. have the two cusps, the left and the right, and the Just right a side. Small puff, please. Yeah. Okay, let's yeah. continue. I will continue. The, we have annular contact. So, yeah, it is it's central all the time. It was really, really nice to see that we, it was yeah. so stable. But you can start pacing. Let's do injection, please. Okay, Yeah. the position is quite good in both places, so we'll just continue. So you go to the LAO. Yeah, for if yeah. you can paste Direction. it 120 again. And we can, we'll take the wire, yeah. uh, bring we'll back the wire back. We'll pull it yeah. back, we just need to see that there is no conduction issue before, but yeah, it's still pacing. I pull the wire just slightly back, it's okay. Yeah, yeah you can continue. Okay, so even in this situation still we have uh, pacing. And I will continue slowly in this yes, situation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Do you apply pressure or tension? Yeah, or just, so just so gen gentle forward yeah. pressure. Yeah. Nothing unique, neutral. Yeah, really, it's really it's center and it's good. And with the FX, and I will continue slowly all the time. Yeah. And the vision still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Good. We have just one uh, C paddle is released, and okay. I will continue. Yeah, yeah. The second one is coming in a second. Yeah, if I can stop pacing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's we have good. both of them yeah. is released. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. So now we just uh, take out the system and. Yeah. So. So. Uh, Let's say, have, just for yes. more curiosity, inject here to see the depth with the multi-purpose. Please. This is no, a great positioning. Actually, we see that, at least in the non, or in the left side of the picture, we, we don't see any, any significant uh, regurgitation also, in yes. the... And blood pressure is reasonable. The implantation three millimeter, exactly, yeah, yeah there. But let's so, keep the wire and check hemodynamics and yeah, then okay. decide about so the we'll, positive. We'll take it out, so I will centralize the nose cone. Yeah, and center, okay. and it's easy, and we'll turn no, back the wire. the wire. Yeah. yeah, looks good. And we have the wire inside, in case of the need for the boss dilatation. And this, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, we Here, we expected it most probably to need boss dilation, right? Yeah. So I will close it yeah, with uh, gray to blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah looks blue. good. Yeah. Let's continue. No, we have the sheet. Yeah. So we can look at also the, the markers. Let's look yeah. at the uh, radio pack markers at the bottom. This is sort of the commissural, the commissural alignment of the patient. And what we see that we have two markers on the left side, one marker on the right yeah. side. This is what we expect to see in humans, yeah. in aortic valves, that there is one commissure between the uh, non and between the left and the right on the right side of the screen. 
When we go more to LAO, it's becoming one, one, one. This is good commissural alignment. This is what we need for a patient with a left main disease. I think that this is a great uh, result, much better than we expected, right, Rami? Uh, even no, no need for post-dilation here. Good commissural alignment, uh, good functioning valve. And maybe we know that this is a patient with critical uh, coronary disease. We need to, uh, yeah. to, to treat his left main and LAD, and, yeah. and I, I, there is no need to delay. We'll just do it uh, now. Okay, so oh. here is a JL35 coming through the frame. Yeah, seven French. I suggest seven That's French. Easily the, yeah, the One of the easiest cannulations ever, huh? So <laughs> people are like talking about post uh, TAVI PCI as an issue. Inject. Fantastic uh, positioning, fantastic yeah. support. It's, it's no issues whatsoever. So we're good to go with the PCI. So you skip two hours now, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it actually took Inject, a bit please. longer than the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the transmission is over the the complex. Yeah, it's a good result. Thank you again. It was a fantastic case. A extremely old patient. Extreme aortic stenosis. A heavy calcification, extreme calcification of both the aortic valve and the coronaries in retrospect. And uh, we did the TAVI and we did the post-evolute PCI easily. And I must say the evolute effects is a great uh, addition to what we have in the TAVI field. And so I'd like to thank uh, the team here that has supported the, the case. And uh, thank you, thank you guys for joining. And we are uh, looking forward to see you in PCR. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. <clears throat> so, it's, it's so excellent, ca excellent case. Yeah. We've seen there were gradients of 120 to 150 invasively, predicted uh, 96, yeah, so around 100. Uh, and we had a significant uh, left main disease uh, treated in the same session, an 85-year-old it's amazing uh, how patients are uh, first, resilient, huh? yes, that they can uh, have so much disease. Very strong many. patients. Uh, so. I'm, I'm amazed at how similar Dan, Danny sounds on the video as he does in person. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was a little skeptical with the initial yeah, sound yeah. level, but, uh, but it became better. <laughs> so, so what do you say? Uh, do yeah, you, yeah. I think, uh, so we have a couple of questions uh, coming from the, uh, the audience. And maybe the first one is for you, uh, Ole. <laughs> about the fact uh, when you apply an early discharge strategy, have you observed a higher frequency of pacemaker afterwards or do, you, do the patient come back for a pacemaker afterwards? Yeah, well, I mean, th that happens sometimes, but it's less than, uh, I mean, it's typically on a yearly basis with a volume of about 500, 550. It's uh, three patients or so that sometimes get in indeed on day two or three in in an emergency with an, uh, a full block, that happens. So that's a, a price, a small price you pay for that. Uh, that's true. Yeah. And maybe the second question could be for you, uh, Owe, because you're. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you have been part of the Optimize Pro, uh, but you know about the data. And mm -hmm. there, there is that question about a patient with a left bundle branch block, a prolonged PR interval. Uh, 24 hours post procedure. Do you discharge the, the patient like that, or do you apply a kind yeah. of uh, uh, monitoring? Yeah, well, well, if we see conduction disease changes, we will monitor a little longer. Um, in the US, the average day of discharge is the first day on average. But in my hospital, it's actually closer to two days. And I'm not, I'm not feeling that that's where I should be expending all of my energy to get patients out on the first day. Um, we're a little more careful about it, a little conservative about it. Um, I often stop some of their medications before they come into the hospital, their beta blockers, their calcium channel blockers to avoid uh, conduction disease. And then we restart them on that first day. And so I like to watch them frequently for that day, especially if they're done it late in the day. If they get their TAVR at 5 p.m., I'm not ready to start their medications at 8 a.m. the next morning and send them out at noon. I like to watch them that extra day. So I think our average is closer to about 1.7 days for our median. Uh, the U.S. average is around 1.4 days, that sort of thing. So I don't feel that that's 
the end of the world. But if they have any conduction disease, they stay another day for telemetry monitoring for sure. And often send them home with an MCOT, a monitor of some sort uh, to watch them. And that okay. sometimes helps with getting them back early um, and not making it a fire drill. If we see a little bit of transient heart block at day 10 or day 12, we can call them in and watch them and or pace them without having to wait for more severe symptomatic heart block. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question, yeah, Stefan, about uh, maybe this one is for you, Danny. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a quite high implant, and that's what we aim at on a daily practice. What about post dilatation? Do you post dilate with such a high implant, or do you have any tips and tricks to share with the audience? Well, uh, there are high implants, and there are high implants. Obviously, <laughs> if it's a minus two, and all of us, we had some supra annular, true supraannular implantations, it's, uh, we cannot exaggerate, right? In these, obviously, we do not uh, do post dilation, but here it was like three millimeters yeah. in depth. Yeah, we just need to keep, make sure to go by the book and rapid pacing that it will be effective to go up, to not to stop the pacing too early. If it's not uh, too high, it's not close to zero, true zero or minus, I don't see a problem. And I think the additional markers not only helped on the alignment here, but also on the depth control as they really go uh, to the end of the sinuses. So I think this is a new feature, actually, not to see when you fully or half implant the valve to see the alignment, but to control it much earlier in the implant process. So you still have some capabilities to turn and to actually nicely align the height also with these additional markers. And this brings me to Howard now to, to perhaps interact a little bit and uh, we've seen this case, so it was easily adaptable to the new uh, system. We saw the longer nose cone, which will help us in the vascular access, also in more difficult cases. We know that, that the sheathless situation sometimes needs a longer nose cone, which we then, of course, have in the ventricle. But Howard, tell us a little bit, yeah. because you've done more about the US experience uh, with this FX device and uh, how this is performing in, in numbers. Yeah, thanks, Devin. I, I really think the FX is a, is a game changer for those of us who use self-expanding platforms uh, regularly. Um, if we pull up the slides for a moment, I can show you, take you through a couple of those features again. Um, yeah. Can you get the slides to come back up for me? No, no there we go. Okay, you can say so I think Danny <laughs> mentioned you did the tip. The tip helps with getting into the femoral artery if you're going sheathless, and, and I think that's an advantage. But probably the two big advantages of the FX system are the single spline, a spine and the enhanced visualization with the markers, um, which allows a few things. The, it is a much more flexible device, and it tracks the wire. Um, generally, in the US, we use Lunderquist wires with Evolute Pro Plus. But with this device, we've all switched to something less stiff, usually a Safari or Safari Extra Small. And it just tracks the wire perfectly. We've never had problems crossing valve and valves, for instance, with the, uh, where we worry about the aorta and large sinuses and sometimes getting hung up on the valve. It just tracks the wire. And the other advantage is that when you release it, because of that, and you're not under such tension with a stiff device, it doesn't jump. And I find that for my younger uh, implanters with less experience, that jump really scares people. When you release it and the valve just unpredictably moves a little bit, um, this one doesn't. It stays right where you so leave it. This is why we start it. at the bottom of the pigtail and not mid pigtail like we mm -hmm. had uh, before. And then the, the markers not only allow you to confirm commissural alignment, um, which is almost 100% now with that, but it also it does allow very precise depth control. You really can see where you are as you're deploying the device, and uh, that, I think, also allows us to place it exactly where we want. We don't routinely aim for zero to two or zero to three. We're, we try to aim for three, and if we get four, we're happy with that as well, but we're, we're in that ballpark of three, four, five um, for our deployments. This is some experience from the first uh, nine U.S. centers uh, in a limited market release of the FX device, 226 patients was put together by uh, Gil Tang's group at Sinai. And what you can see is the excellent device success rates, the low mortality stroke, faster complication rates, but also a low pacemaker rate because we're allowed, uh, able with these markers to place it high, low paravalvular leaks, and importantly, 97% 
uh, commissural alignment. So I think that really improves the access to the coronaries, it improves durability, and I think it sets a new standard for what we should be doing in TAVR, which is get commissural alignment. We have other valves, you have the accurate uh, NEO2, we don't have that one in the US, but I think commissural alignment is really going to be important for valve durability as well as coronary access in the future. So maybe, uh, Danny, uh, before we conclude the session, there is one question coming from the audience about the rationale for performing the PCI post-TAVI and not doing the PCI before the valve implantation. Was it, what was the, re the main reason for that? Well, obviously, it, it's a difficult uh, scenario and uh, with a mean gradient above 100 and with a good systolic LV, it drives us to focus more on the valve before we do a coronary work. These patients can deteriorate dramatically if we do coronary work with critical, critical AS. And uh, sometimes it's challenging to decide what should be the first approach. Okay, so I guess it's time to uh, conclude that uh, session. That was a fantastic one once again. Uh, what did we learn uh, today to better uh, appreciate and understand that we, are, we need to treat more patients that the, profile, the risk profile of the patient is evolving with uh, more younger patients with a longer life expectancy. So we need to uh, be perfect for the index procedure, but as well uh, think about the future and for the second step uh, for every single patient. We understood how maybe potentially simulation could help us in the uh, device type selection and uh, tailoring the procedure as the team in Leipzig has done uh, to the specific patient that we are treated and no, not discussing on a general, uh, from a general perspective, but really focused on the patient uh, we have in the cat lab or the OR. And so we will see in the future how these tools are going to be implemented. And uh, we are really looking forward to uh, getting the effects uh, within our hands because we could uh, appreciate uh, how uh, predictable the outcomes seem to be with that device. And uh, so the first thank you as usual, and uh, it's, comes, it's for you because we, we could see all the, uh, the quality of the uh, uh, engagement that you had with all the questions, uh, the comments that you provided us uh, with. Uh, thank you to uh, the speakers because it was a very nice discussion and I really much enjoyed it from a personal perspective. Uh, thank you to you for your support and moderating such a, a nice uh, interactive discussion. And thank you to Medtronic for proposing such a high quality TNT. And I wish you all the best for the rest of the meeting.